My name is Jared Brennan. I'm a security consultant out of Columbus. Um, first time at CodeMesh, long time listening. Uh, today I wanted to talk through the uh, uh, offensive web testing framework from OWASP. I'll give you a little bit of context about me uh, and the talk because unfortunately I am not a developer. I'm actually insanely jealous of people who've chosen development as a career path. I, I really dig security, don't get me wrong. I just wish I could write more code than I can write. I can read code. Uh, but my job uh, over the past 15, coming up on 20 years, has been to be a breaker, to look at how an attacker might abuse weaknesses in web and now uh, mobile applications, and then take that information back to the, the developers and say, here's what the bad guys do, here's how you can get ahead of them and put controls in place that are going to keep them from being effective at breaking your app, taking your stuff offline, stealing stuff that they shouldn't have access to. Um, my job right now, uh, I work for GBQ Partners. Uh, it's an audit and tax firm. They bought a security consulting company, and uh, I came on board after that acquisition. Uh, so a lot of my work is still web application security assessments, uh, penetration tests, um, security control assessments in general. But before I get into uh, the, the details of the tool, I wanted to talk through some, some blocking and tackling some basic uh, fundamentals uh, from my view of application security and where it lives in the, the dev lifecycle. Um, I spent a number of years building out the InfoSec program at Abercrombie and Fitch. I am the quintessential Abercrombie model. Um, but they needed to bring somebody in to do PCI, payment card security. Uh, so I did uh, a lot of what the payment card standard uh, dictates in terms of building out and managing a security program and then moved on to uh, the ISO 27000 series, which is much more robust. But in the PCI space, they have some very specific language around penetration testing. Penetration testing is not vulnerability scanning. Vulnerability scanning is one small component of penetration testing. Penetration testing has the objective of breaking controls to either get to something you're not supposed to get to or force a system or application to do something the developers or admins didn't design it to do. Um, penetration testing in PCI uh, has uh, very specific scoping language. You have to do it from inside the house and you have to do it from the external network. And they also uh, delineate between pen testing systems and pen testing applications. Now in the PCI world, the scoping is uh, payment applications. So if it's got credit cards passing through it, you should hit it. But um, I was able to use this language to uh, help educate some of the people I work with that it's not enough to point Nessus at a box and run a scan and say I did a pen test. You actually have to do things like uh, configure a web application scanner with credentials to log into your web app and poke around and see what it can break, see what it can do. Uh, with the bug bounty programs, particularly uh, Bug Crowd and Hacker One, we're seeing an uh, explosion of vulnerability disclosure which I love because it's holding people accountable. One of my friends just sitting outside this room right before the talk uh, had posted to uh, Spotify's Hacker One program that uh, there was a breach of, of uh, customer information, looks like passwords, and he reported it as a responsible researcher should through their bug bounty program and they flagged it as not applicable. So he tweeted it out to say, hey, thanks for telling me that this paste bin, here's the link, is not applicable. So if you want to check it out, his name's Jason Kent, a uh, really good guy, really uh, uh, stand up, but he's uh, a little cantankerous when he gets pissed off. Um, in addition to uh, the vulnerabilities disclosure, we're seeing more and more tools published, especially to GitHub. It's I have a handful of subreddits that I follow to help keep in the know with what's going on from a, a hacking and pen testing standpoint. And it's got to be every week. There's one or two new tools that I add to my toolbox Sometimes I just tuck them away and say, if I ever get into a situation where a client has this specific technology, I'm going to give this tool a try. Um, and because of these two elements, um, if you're a developer and you're publishing applications that are internet facing or you're public publishing applications uh, to mobile app stores, um, you're more likely to be a target today than you were even a year ago, than you were three years ago. Uh, and that's not a trend that we anticipate is going to um, pull back. The other piece that I see, uh, and this comes from my time at um, The Ohio State University, uh, how many of you have ever received a, a questionnaire 
uh, from a client or a customer saying, I need you to prove to me that you securely developed this application. Answer these questions. All right, sorry for your pain. Uh, for the folks who did not raise your hands, I'm sorry for the pain that you're going to feel because you'll get that eventually. It's becoming more and more commonplace for the big shops especially to say, we are not going to do business with you unless you can prove that your environment is secure. Now, that environment includes everything security from how do we hire people to background checks to uh, vulnerability management and patching of servers. But it also includes a very specific subset of how do you protect your application. And what I found with this tool I'm going to talk through today, um, it gives you not only uh, <laughs> the opportunity to honestly say, yes, we're answering it. And if you don't honestly say yes, you're not alone. There are a lot of people who say yes just to get the business. I get it. Um, but it also uh, aligns with some of the specific frameworks that they're going to be um, asking you about. In my world, um, again, outsider looking in, uh, I, I, <laughs> I would say I understand the concepts of, of positive testing and negative testing. And I'm sure if, if you're testing your apps, you've got a better understanding than I do of what those words mean. But in my world, positive is a, a finite set of uh, inputs to produce an expected output, right? If I'm doing a zip code lookup, and I plug in 43026, it should say Hilliard, Ohio, right? That's a positive test. It worked as designed. If I'm doing a zip code lookup look up, and I plug in 257 alphanumeric special characters random, uh, you'll say, well, why the hell would anybody do that? What's the point? I, I would do that, uh, whether it's out of curiosity or whether it's out of a way to get the application to tell me what's on the back end, what's under the hood, uh, so I can um, target future attacks. Uh, this tool that we're uh, going to be talking about is built all around negative testing and how, how do we throw random inputs at the application to get it to um, misbehave. And I know that you're already dealing with functionality testing, usability testing, interface compatibility, performance, security testing is one more thing. But ideally, if we can get to a point that we've got a continuous flow, just like with continuous release uh, uh, development processes that you're always making changes and publishing new cool stuff to the apps. As a consumer of those apps, I really dig that. How do we build security into that? Um, this tool gives you the ability uh, to um, accelerate those processes. And apologies for the, the feels for any of my other Harry Potter fans. Um, and the other piece is, uh, this is a tool that's published and maintained as a flagship OWASP project. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But that means that somebody else is doing all the maintenance which means that if you're building your own tools or processes in-house, your own scripts to test your apps, uh, this will help take some of that burden off of you so you don't get pulled away from building your app to building and maintaining the thing that tests the security of the app that you were supposed to be building. So right into the OWTF, Offensive Web Testing Framework. It's not just a tool, but it's a collection of tools that are all baked into, uh, I mean, the GitHub repository. You can just pull the, the file down and blow it up on your box. Um, but I'll talk about how I use it as a pen tester to help uh, shave some of that time off as well. You can pull it down from uh, OWASP, uh, as I mentioned, as one of the flagship projects. Uh, it's actively maintained, which means people are getting in there and fine-tuning it and keeping it sexy. Uh, and they built this on um, using these three resources that were already in play. The OWASP testing guide, uh, the penetration testing execution standard, and NIST special publication 800-115. A uh, lot of gibberish, so jump into each of those. Um, the OWASP testing project is on its fourth iteration. Does anyone use this yet? It, I love that. It is fan-freaking-tastic. The day I found this as a pen tester, it fixed so many of our processes that we were struggling with or where we felt, we're, are we doing our customers right? Are we testing everything we should be? Um, the OWASP testing guide is, what, 11 test categories in the current iteration. Uh, it's got over 100 unique application security tests, like how do we test configuration management? How do we test info validation? Uh, and it gives you guidance on here's what you should be testing. Here are some tools traditionally in the free and open source space that you can use to do that testing. Uh, and here's the, the expected results of the test. Um, it's a, a hefty little PDF, uh, but a lot of useful info. And if you just want to go through and build a punch down list of the tests that matter in your app, in your environment, it's an incredible resource. Uh, on top of that, um, they've added the NIST uh, special publication 800 115 
This National Institute of Standards and Technology has hundreds of special publications on how to do security in information systems and applications. Uh, and they talk in 800.115 about security testing. And this is, again, the distinction that uh, is, is very important for us to take away. It's not just the scan, which would be part of the discovery phase, right? I want to identify the, um, what the, I want to footprint the application, understand the inputs, understand the expected outputs. Even just spidering the app to know what URLs would be in scope for testing is all in that discovery phase. In attacking an application, you're trying to uh, gain access. Um, well, sorry, system browsing is, is part of the footprinting. Um, installing additional tools. If you've ever had anybody uh, upload a malicious PHP file to your application, that's an example of where I find that you allow for an image upload, but you're not validating MIME types, or you're not checking to see whether or not the image is actually an image. I upload a PHP file, and then when I browse to the location of that file, I can interact with the file through the, the web server, the app server. I don't have to um, be restricted as, as an outsider. Then I'm on the box with the privileges on the box. And at that point, I'm looking for ways to escalate privilege. Can I create an account? Can I elevate my account from a traditional user to a root level or an admin level account? Um, our traditional web app scanners and web app assessment tools, whether it's uh, source code review, uh, dynamic application security testing, uh, binary testing, they, they don't do any of this attack stuff. And from my perspective as a pen tester, the attack stuff is the most important and valuable uh, testing you can do in an application because it's real. It's not the hypothetical somebody might someday pop this cross-site scripting vulnerability and then uh, get the cookies from the, the visitors to my web app. But the, the testing piece says, I'm actually going to go through the process like an attacker and see how easy it is to do see whether or not I've got something else built into my app that's going to shut that attack down, which makes this a false positive, which means I don't have to fix it, and I can focus over here on these other enhancements or bugs that are a higher priority than this thing that showed up in the security scan. So the attacking piece gives you validation, but for the third-party uh, assessments, where somebody says, tell me that you are testing your application, they're going to ask about uh, your software development lifecycle. And if you can say, one of the tools that we use in our process is built on NIST 81115. Any organization that is looking to NIST for guidance is going to say, oh, you're good then. You are not the problem, child, I have to worry about. I've got other people I've got to talk to. You know what you're doing. So it gives them a higher sense of, of confidence uh, in working with you. The penetration testing execution standard is a grassroots project. Um, Chris Nickerson, Dave Kennedy, uh, a few people who've been pen testing since before we called it penetration testing, um, stood this, uh, this standard up as a way to help improve the pen test process. So that if you were asking somebody to do a pen test of your environment, you could uh, walk away with a high sense of, of uh, confidence that they did the right thing. Um, and the offensive web testing framework aligns with uh, what intelligence gathering, vulnerability analysis, uh, and in some cases, exploitation and post-exploitation. Because the tools that they've built into the framework allow you to not just pop the vulnerability, but then see what you can do after the fact. So, uh, tech specs, Python, Python Postgres, uh, is designed to run on a Linux environment. Is anybody familiar with Kali? Linux used to be Backtrack. If you've got Kali, uh, you can drop uh, ODBTF on there, a little bit of customization and you're using it within a matter of minutes. <clears throat> a lot of dependencies are already built into Kali, and uh, where OWTF might expect you to install some extra tools, uh, because Kali is a penetration testing distribution, it's got a lot of those tools built in already. So it just points to the, the native Kali patch, saves you the time. At a high level, and this will be your first uh, um, experience with OWTF as soon as you fire it up and, and launch it for the first time. There's a web UI. Um, under the hood, there are a handful of scanners. So, so there's curl to allow us to, to talk to web applications from the command line. But there's also um, Arachne, W3AF, uh, Skipfish, which is uh, like out on Google code, right? It's uh, an older project, but they, they baked it in. Uh, and then another OWASP project, Gearbuster. Those are the um, 
the, the discovery pieces, right? They're going to do a lot of the first pass heavy lifting, what's here that an attacker might exploit. But beyond those, there are a number of other tools baked in that as a, a tester, I mean, this is what made Kali so popular over the years. As a pen tester, instead of having to sit down and roll my own Linux distro every time I want to uh, uh, work on a client engagement, um, I just I pull down the version of Kali or I take my own tricked out version and make a couple of tweaks and I can be effective right away. Right, it takes all the busy work off the table and lets me dive in. Uh, and uh, there are probably some tools on here that you've used um, in the past. I'll talk WP Scan in particular for uh, um, today's talk uh, is very relevant. But once uh, once you fire it up, um, you browse to like local uh, host right one twenty seven zero zero one over port eight zero zero nine. Uh, and at that point, it's just a web app, and you can go in and make configuration changes about, do I want to use the Kali version of this tool? Do I want to put my own instance? Um, so we've got some configuration options there. And then one uh, important note, not just for today's talk, but for the, uh, the use of this tool in general. There are three uh, test types, passive, semi-passive, and active. In a pen testing uh, attack and pen scenario, passive means I'm not showing up in the logs. I'm going to use open source intelligence gathering techniques to go to publish information, right? I'll go to Shodan. I'll go to Census. I'll go to sites that have already collected information about your internet-facing web apps, and I'll query those sites so that your security team doesn't know that I'm uh, doing any recon on your environment. Semi-passive is playing like a, a regular user. I'm going to go to your website. I'm going to poke, prod. I might do what, um, uh, well, that's crossing the line. When uh, uh, healthcare.gov was launched, uh, Dave Kennedy, trusted sec, did an open source security assessment, right, is what he called it. He essentially poked around at their application to see what, what it would do and found that they had missed a lot of security testing uh, in their hurry to get that published. Um, but going to a search field and throwing in uh, queries that are likely to trigger a SQL injection response, right, an indicator that the app is vulnerable to SQL injection, um, that bleeds from uh, semi-passive into active, which is where I'm, I'm looking for ways to break your stuff. Um, automated web app scanners are very clearly active. This distinction is very important for uh, things like law enforcement and prosecution and uh, am I allowed to be doing what I'm doing? You're allowed to do passive all day. If it is public information that you're pulling from another site, that's, that's not an attack. Semi-passive, if you are interacting with servers that have been deliberately exposed to the public in a way that, that they were intended to be interacted with, browsing and navigating, I'd argue that's still legit. As soon as you start probing for vulnerabilities, you risk the chance of breaking something, um, and especially if, if you find a, a login portal and you're looking for weaknesses in the authentication mechanism, uh, there are clear laws on the books that say as soon as you log in, you're, you're breaking the law. So I've done my due diligence. I've told you to be careful. But uh, the test separation by plug-in also helps you build out the, the test in a way that line up with that. So the workflow in OWTF, uh, step one, you're going to, uh, once you get it installed, you fire up the web UI, and then you log in and do the, the initial recon, the initial scan. Uh, once you have the information from the scans, you need to do a, a quick analysis, right? Is there anything there that I care about? And then where um, OWTF gets really sexy is uh, with the, uh, the analysis phase, right? When you're going through your vulnerabilities, if it sees something that it says you, you could poke around and try to break this, it gives you uh, specific tools that you can use for that validation. And the command line, uh, like the, what do I want to say, they look like paragraphs. Um, the command line parameters pre-built that you just jump over to a command line, copy, paste, and it's going to give you a very quick yes, no, is this something I need to worry about? Or can I uh, pull additional information out from this environment? Um, the tool is built with a, a reporting piece that you can do all of your workflow within the tool. And this is going to be my first your mileage may vary comment. Uh, when it comes to automation, you don't want to get so caught up in the web app pen testing that it's actually slower or less effective than your current testing uh, processes. I, I personally, for, as a pen tester, I have a few recommendations for the things that I would 
uh, hope that you had built in to your testing processes? Because if you build these things in, I know you're going to shut me down every time I'm brought in to, to test an app. Um, but even if uh, in a team-based environment, if you wanted to put some comments about, yeah, I saw this and we're going to upgrade that in the next release, so don't sweat it. We're not going to waste any time testing this anymore. Uh, you can do all that within the tool so that if somebody else logs in later, you're not uh, repeating effort. Um, the installation uh, process uh, is rock simple, git clone, or um, they've got a bootstrap script that pulls down a ton of info. It takes, what, five, ten minutes on a fairly beefy laptop to get everything up and running. Uh, but again, if you start in Kali, uh, so I've got the, the link, you can pull down a, a Kali um, Linux uh, virtual machine. Um, it, it saves a lot more time. And anybody using Docker? So if, if you want to go Docker, they've got on the um, GitHub repo a whole Docker uh, set of instructions. Um, with this uh, slide deck, I'm real big. I went to school to be a music teacher. So anytime I do a talk, I put everything I have out on the Internet. Um, I'm doing this talk later on at the Columbus OWASP chapter in January and then uh, Columbus B-Sides in, I think it's in May. So I've got to wait until I get through a couple more uh, before I can publish this online. But I'll have contact info at the end that if you want to reach out to me, say, Jerry, can you hook me up with uh, the slides? I'll send all this stuff your way so that you don't have to go digging for the same info. Um, quick note, uh, Cali is at 2017.3 right now. Um, when I upgraded Kali, uh, it broke my um, OWTF install. Uh, I had to just install it to a different directory and I'm good to go, um, which has been my experience with this tool. Uh, I reinstalled it a few times just instead of troubleshooting. That's the IT crowd who you tried turning it off and on again. Um, gets a job done every time. Ton of documentation out at docswowtf.org. Um, and I, I wanted to touch on these before I get into screenshots of the tool, and then I wanted to show you um, the tool kind of in action. I'm not going to attack anybody today, but I do want to show you some stuff. Uh, so when you fire it up for the first time, you have to make a, uh, a directory unique to your test process, right? If, if you're testing an app, in my world, I would use this based on an engagement. So I would use the client's name and maybe the date. That would be the name of my directory. So. Uh, it's important to have that um, directory unique to uh, um, a particular application or a particular test, um, I want to say collection of tests, uh, because what's going to happen when you run these tools, if any of the tools generate output, they're all going to drop in that directory. Um, so in knowing what that directory is and where it is is kind of important. Also, um, the, uh, what is it? the virtual environment, the work on OWTF. Um, this is all Python driven. So to create a like an isolated Python process, um, you have to create that virtual environment or the tool won't work. But you create the virtual environment, uh, you turn on the database or fire up the database, turn it on, um, and then you're good to go. You just run the, the Python script. And at that point, on the local host, you can log into the uh, web UI. The very first thing you're going to see in the tool is the, uh, well, you get a splash screen that says this is the OWTF and some uh, uh, info about it. But then uh, it's, it's built around sessions. A session, um, I don't know how to describe it, it's, it's a, a collection of tests that you want to run against the collection of targets. So if, if you have a web app that you're testing internally, you could create a unique session for every test you wanted to run. Uh, if you've got a whole collection of web apps and you want to test them all for cross-site scripting or injection-based attacks, you could create a session that's got all of them listed as targets, but then you configure uh, the, the test based on what you want. This is driving me freaking nuts. Sorry about that. Um, so it's up to you how you, uh, how you organize it. Um, but they give you flexibility to do it in a way that makes sense to you. So what you do is you would type in the, uh, the URL um, or the uh, IP address of your target. It's going to call out, see if it can find it. And then when it finds it, it's going to add it to the target list and uh, it'll pull back the IP address associated with the host name. And once you've got the uh, session in place, um, you, uh, let me jump back. You tell it to run, I, and I hate this from a design perspective because uh, I don't want to tell it uh, to run until I tell it the parameters that I run it to run with. 
but uh, they've designed it uh, with inverse, right? That you tell it to run, and then you pick your plugins, and then you click run again. Um, but when you go into the the plugin uh, screen, um, you've got your targets selected from the previous page. Um, you're going to get what 137 different tests that you can execute against your application. 121 of these tests are um, classified as w uh, OWTF, and they're built out of the um, OWASP testing guide and then just some slight customization. And then they've got a few others that they classified as P-Test. I'll be frank, I don't understand why they use that classification. Um, but in the OWASP testing guide, like for example, you might do CM-008 which is the eighth test in the configuration management uh, subset. Um, and so if you came in here and searched for CM, it would pull up all of the uh, configuration management tests. If you search for injection, it'll pull up all the injection tests. So the search feature lets you pick the plugins you want, then you just start checking checkboxes, and then when you're ready to go, um, once you've selected at least one, uh, a launch, or no, they're up there. Launch individually or launch in groups. Um, I always launch individually, but um, play around with it, see what happens. And then it's going to uh, reach out. That's actually going to start the process collecting information about the targets. Um, they also have three additional uh, identifiers, web, net, and aux. Um, web is all the active, semi-passive, uh, talking back and forth to the web apps. Um, net gets into uh, some of the, the attack, um, like brute force, if you're trying to use Durbuster to identify all the subdirectories that might exist on a uh, website, um, that would be one of the net. Uh, and then aux would be uh, some of the actual exploit activity. My recommendation for you is if you've not spent time in the OWASP testing guide, or even if you have and you want to have a better understanding of how you might apply this in your environment, uh, just go through the testing guide with this tool fired up, and the back and forth between the tool, things start to click, things start to fall in place. Once you uh, run those tests, um, it's going to pull back information about what it discovered. Um, if there are output files, um, you can, from the web UI, click Browse, and it'll take you right to the directory in the box so you don't have to go poking around for them. Um, but it's going to capture uh, request and response. So if you want to dig into uh, what was the client doing, what was the server, how was the server responding, what did that conversation look like, you have that entire history in here. Um, and uh, it, at the end, and I'll, I'll show you this. It makes more sense for me to show that than, than talk about it. Um, but I'll show you how they, they're organized when you uh, log in. You can also... Um, tweak the, the rankings that might come back and say, this is really bad, I'm going to give it a five. Like, I, I don't need any of that. Um, I usually ignore that stuff. If anything, it helps inform the things I should be manually testing or trying to exploit during a pen test. From a dev perspective, and you're talking about testing, um, if anything, it might guide the priority. Uh, if you've got some sort of bug tracking system and you just want to take data from this and, and load it in there, take findings from here output and put it in and say, we found this, we need to fix it it might help you uh, identify the, the bug. But on the, the notes piece, right, this little notes icon shows up, you click that, and it gives you um, a little editor to put your notes in um, if you want to share with somebody else internally. Um, skip over the filter, that's for looking at this later. Uh, the transaction log, which keeps information about not just the, the conversation, but the HTTP options, HTTP status, uh, when, so you can sequentially put things back together. Um, that's all there. But there are two pieces I, I wanted to mention uh, as well, workers and work lists. Um, work list is these are all the things I want to test, the workers or the processes running on the box that manage all of that. You can have one worker, you can have multiple workers, you can have one work list, you can have multiple work lists. If you've got a really hefty application and you want to run all the tests, it might take uh, days for the test to complete. Uh, but if you want to redistribute that workload using workers and work lists. Uh, it'll help you burn through the, the testing um, process even faster. Um, managing work lists. So, <clears throat> test cases. 
I want to go back to, to workflow and just kind of walk through that. Step one, you would add your target. Step two, run your plugin. Step three, analyze the results. And then if you find anything that you want to uh, attack, you want to validate, you pull that out of the web UI, go to the command line, run the command line tools. So you got to look at the output of those tools. And then you can either take the notes back in the notes function in the web UI or whatever the, again, bug tracking process is. And then if I uh, generate, kick out a report, uh, I mean, in, in my world, I wouldn't even do that because it's really just for the uh, the information it provides. And then I would go into whatever I'm, I'm using for my pen test workflow uh, to put the info out there. But that's the, the short list of everything I, I just talked through. The handful of tests that I recommend you use with this tool. Uh, number one, uh, test the SSL TLS config. This is not just is my data appropriately protected in transit, but I guarantee you that if a third party comes knocking and says, I need you to prove to me that your application is secure, they're going to go out to Qualys SSL Labs. They're going to go out to Mozilla TLS Observatory. They're going to look at the output that those two tools provide about your SSL TLS config, and they're going to start there. So this is a quick way to get ahead of that. And from a security perspective, if you were targeted by an actual uh, sophisticated attacker, these four tests would uh, tell you whether or not your SSL TLS is reasonably configured to protect against those attacks. So protecting data in transit through encryption, uh, if you type in either SSL or TLS in the filter, you'll get that input or those options. Uh, test for cross-site scripting. So you want to filter on the word cross or words cross-site scripting, not XSS. And it'll pull back six different tests, which include DOM-based, uh, reflected, and stored. Um, so you'll be able to test there. Uh, and then for injection flaws, um, do not just test your application for SQL injection. Uh, I was on a pen test for a client, and they had published a, uh, for whatever reason, their um, PBX system, their phone system, had a web interface, and they published it externally. An admin should not have to log into the phone system from the outside. They should do it over VPN. But because it was external and because they hadn't changed the default admin password, I looked up the admin guide. I was logged in as admin. And I found that uh, within the app, there was a way that I could uh, pull back network stats from the management box in the target systems. And it was doing, like, one of the commands was a ping. There was a trace route. And as I'm looking through the list, I'm thinking, like, Whoever wrote this just wrote a shim between the, the web interface and these commands. I guarantee if, uh, if I run this uh, command, it's, it's just going to say, hey, Jerry wants to ping this IP address. So what I did is I brought up, um, I use uh, uh, OWASP as a, another project, Mantra, that unfortunately is not moving forward. It's a tricked out version of either Firefox or Chrome with all these uh, uh, very handy web app security tools built into the browser. And there's a, an in-browser proxy camper data that uh, well, it's, it's just uh, intercept. It lets me intercept the, the headers and modify uh, the commands I'm sending to the web app. So what I did when I got into this app is I sent one of these ping commands. And instead of allowing it to send the ping command to the server, I intercepted that traffic. And I'm like, let's create a user. And so I was trying to do things that I should not be able to do as a user of the web application on the server, but based on the permissions that they had on the server and based on that weakness in the application, uh, I was able to get into the client's environment internally. I was on their internal network from the outside by exploiting a web app vulnerability. That was an injection attack, but it was not a SQL injection attack. Injection attacks are any command, any service on the back end that I can talk to. Um, OWTF has... SMTP injection, code command, LDAP, XML, and XPath. So if you're building out injection-based attacks, in my opinion, these are more significant and more severe than uh, cross-site scripting. I know in the top 10, cross-site scripting and injection go back and forth. But uh, when you want to get into an environment, injection is the way to do it. There are 12 tests there. So if you took this back and only did the SSL test, the injection test, and the, uh, what was the previous one? cross-site scripting test, right? That's a very small subset of what the OWTF has to offer. And I can tell you as a guy who's been doing web app pen testing for years, if you were only doing that subset, you were going to make my job very hard. And you, so from a, an attacker perspective, you can also tell the people, 
who are paying you to write the code, look, they're not going to get in. If somebody tries to take advantage of the application, because we're doing these tests, we're shutting them down. Um, so again, uh, I wanted to encourage you to think like a pen tester uh, and attack your app first, because that's going to harden it from actual attacks. But let me jump real quick. How much time do I have? Sorry? Yes. Oh, my God, that's a lot of time. I'm talking like a fiend today, folks. Normally, uh, they have to drag me off the, the podium. All right, let me jump over here. Yeah. All right, so here's an example of the, uh, the web UI. You fire it up. Um, I don't even think it's credentialed, so uh, I do not recommend firing this up on a server. Uh, if you're on a subnet and you don't want other people seeing the vulnerabilities of your app, if they find this IP address, they'll be able to do everything that you can do. Um, but it's uh, a design choice. Uh, right here on the target page, page, sorry. You know what? I've got 25 minutes. I've got time to adjust my display settings. Bear with me. Much better. All right. So you would name your session whatever you want to name it. Um, uh, keep in mind, this is a, an open source project, although they've actively maintained it and put in a ridiculous amount of work to get all these tools to talk to each other. Still a little buggy. I've had my fair share of 500 errors. Um, just trying to fire it up and use it. But you type in a session, uh, and I did this preparing to come up here. So I created a session called Code Mesh, added it. And then once the session was in play, um, I'm going to add another website here. Oh, except I'm not online. That's all right. I could jump on my hotspot. But what it would have done if it could have... Uh, called out to the internet, it would have connected out to the company website and then added it to the target list. Um, once you've got the targets, then select your target. That's fine. Click run. I may have broken it because I'm not online. Come on. Ah, there we go. So you'd pull up all the tools that you want to use. And then once you've got everything selected, launch individually, launching groups. Like I said, I usually launch individually. Um, and then the workers are going to show you, uh, by default, they fire up four workers. Um, again, these are the individual processes that are managing that communication to the app. They'll show you what test each worker is executing and how far along it is. Um, all of the input, because all the tools that they're using are command line tools from the open source community. So all that input is still, or input output, it's happening under the covers. You just don't see it. Um, and the work list, sorry, um, will show you some of the same info, different view. Um, but it went screaming fast for the uh, the test I did. So I pulled up the CodeMash.org website, uh, which I am not authorized to test, so I automatically excluded any active test, right? Because I always follow the rules. Um, but for this, I, I just did some uh, passive testing, and I said, what can you tell me about the, the CodeMash.org web app? And it came back with, uh, there were two options enabled uh, outside of your traditional get and post. Um, the uh, HTTP options option, which is going to tell me what options are available on the web server, and the uh, trace option. Um, an attacker is going to look at how the web server is configured and say, can I talk to the web server, right? Have they uh, left put turned on? Have they let, uh, left delete turned on? Um, you'd be surprised. I still bump into that. Uh, here, I mean, that's reasonable. Um, but if I'm looking at the results and I have no idea what I need to do with this information, 
You can see down here at the bottom, they link out to uh, hexillion.com so that you can read up on what does this mean that they have these uh, two options available. So that didn't tell me anything interesting, but um, this one did. Uh, I want to take a look at robots.txt. Why do I want to look at robots.txt? Sorry? Exactly. It tells me the one thing that the developers don't want people looking at. So they did have uh, a robots.txt file. And if you look here, semi-passive. The scanner actually browsed to the robots.txt file and read the output on the screen. Uh, and the output on the screen was WP admin. What does that tell us? Uh, yeah, so codemash.org is running on a WordPress site. Um, it won't show up in your traditional uh, Google, Bing, DuckDuckGo search, right? Because the robots.txt is doing its job. But this lets you know, is that it configured in a way that somebody's going to start poking around? So after I found that information, I went back and ran uh, the testing guide. Um, I can't remember what the IG stands for. Sorry, but information gathering. So from OWASP's testing guide, the IG001 is the very first thing it tells you to do. If I had run the active test, it would have spidered the entire website. I told it I wanted to do the IG001 test, but because I didn't have permission, kept everything to passive and semi-passive. Otherwise, I would have all the URLs that would be exposed externally that I could start poking around at. Um, for the web application fingerprint, the passive test, it took, what, 39 seconds? Um, and it said uh, it found... WordPress, and, and see, this is where it, you've got to use some interpretation of Joomla, Drupal, Mambo. I don't know that this is all there, but I know from the, uh, the combination of the robots.txt and the web application fingerprint test that WordPress is almost definitely there. And I will say that uh, uh, I did browse to the WP admin to validate that it was there. I did not try to log in, um, so I didn't test that. I would appreciate, uh, had I run the SSL TLS test, it would have thrown an error that they're not encrypting their login page. So uh, I don't know who runs the site, but security guy. I'm paid paranoid, that's what I do. Um, but here, under WordPress, it says, well, if you want to use the WP scan plugin, here's the Ruby command that will fire up WP scan to uh, pull information back uh, from a WordPress specific vulnerability scanner. Has anybody used WP scan? I'm seeing a, a couple over here, any? So of all the people in this room, uh, we've got what, maybe two or three people who are familiar with that tool. If you're testing uh, um, an application that uh, is built on WordPress, right, for example, everybody in this room now has the exact same capabilities to pull information back about that test uh, by using this tool. You go through this tool and say enumerate. Based on the enumeration, you say show me the commands that I might want to run. You copy paste, and now you don't have to figure out all the ins and outs of using WP scan. You can be effective much more quickly in testing that. Um, and again, this, this is where, uh, where I had to stop. But if you wanted to do um, Durbuster, uh, see if somebody, and I just had this with a client, um, they were running uh, IIS. So Microsoft has done a pretty good job over the years of adding more and more security, like FXCOP is now baked in, and, and some of the other uh, web security tools that they developed as standalone are built into that, that IIS um, engine. Um, but for some reason, they did not restrict uh, directory browsing. So now it wasn't for the whole site, but if you kept poking around, uh, I was able, and this is all through manual testing. I didn't use, I should have used OWTF because it would save me a ridiculous amount of time in testing that. But going through the, the site, I found something that uh, was clearly an unprotected directory. And then from that directory, I started navigating and going deeper and coming back up. And I eventually got to a directory that had source code in it. I'm on the internet without credentials navigating their web application, and I potentially got access to source code. Now, what um, saved them in this case 
was that when I tried to access the source code files, uh, I was rejected because IIS wasn't explicitly configured to serve those files up to me through the application. So it wouldn't let me view the file, it wouldn't let me download the file. It threw an error that said the app or the, the web server is not configured to, uh, um, what is it, handle that extension. Um, so they, you know, good for them. Uh, but this is, these tools here, if, if I were to run the same active assessments of the tools using Durbuster, I might find where somebody has left a test directory published uh, or where somebody has uh, another engagement that we worked on. Um, a client was contacted by an independent security researcher. So somebody who was just poking around on the internet to see what he could find. And he found uh, on this client's website, they handled uh, financial things. And so their customers could uh, submit applications through the, uh, the web app. Um, once a customer completed submitting an application, which had a lot of sensitive information about the customer, uh, the app would generate a PDF of that application and archive it in a directory so that they could come back and, and see that information. You know where I'm going with this, right? Same directory was not protected, so somebody poking around on this uh, company's website found hundreds, we're talking years worth of files in a web-enabled internet-facing directory. Um, and the, the developer that we talked to when, because uh, they engaged us for incident response, so like, what do we do? How do we handle this? And as we talked to them, we're like, well, why did you have that? I mean, that's what obvious question. Why did you have that turned on? Why did you have that enabled? Like, I didn't even know the application was doing that. So this person had inherited the application from a developer who had built that function in previously. It was an undocumented uh, feature. Uh, and it was something that fortunately it was a uh, an ethical security researcher who found it and not a blackmailer or someone who could extort this company for a considerable amount of money to keep this information hidden. So with the, the tool here, um, if you're testing um, internet facing applications, uh, you could use some of the other tools like Durbuster and then the Durbuster, in this case, Durbuster WordPress All. You don't have to understand all the flags that Durbuster has available to you. You can just copy paste and get useful information to start with. At that point, you can build out your knowledge of which tools uh, you like and which ones don't make sense. I'm not going to do any of that today. Um, that is a little above and beyond what I wanted to cover here. Let me jump back down into this. And then bring this back up. So that's what uh, I wanted to give you um, with the time we had this morning is just Here's the tool. I think it's super sexy. As an attacker, as somebody who works as a professional penetration tester, uh, I see value in the tool in helping to inform you of where the exploitable vulnerabilities are or could be in your application, and then providing you guidance on how to validate and shut those uh, holes before somebody actually attacks, or even more importantly, before you engage somebody to come in and hack away at your web application. Um, the few uh, tips I wanted to share out based on my own experience with the tool. You will need to pull down W3AAF, um, which is a, a www auditing framework. I think it's another open source project. Um, it's not, at least it wasn't in the versions of Kali that I was playing around with. Um, and it's crucial to the, the tool, all the information gathering. Um, uh, there's a dependency script that gets dropped into a uh, temp deer when you're pulling that down. So it's not just the git clone of W3AF, but you've got to put all the dependencies in. It's just a little headache that I dealt with that I don't want you to have to deal with, so now you know. Uh, and my user experience with the application, thank you, has been a, a little buggy, uh, which is exactly what I'd expect for uh, an open source project that is as complex as this one. It's got a lot of moving parts, folks. There's a lot of stuff in there. Very first time I fired it up and tried to use it, I couldn't do anything. It was throwing ACT 500 errors before I could add the first target. Um, uh, what um, what I found with uh, the, the default session, the very first session that's created upon the first execution of the application, just ignore it. it there's a, a Postgres database entry associated with that session. 
if you leave that alone, you're more likely to uh, not have problems. Um, and then the um, multiple runs against the same application in the same session may overwrite scan data. If you run WP scan in one directory and you've got one session, you come back later, and, or not WP scan, just run a, a discovery scan, and you run a discovery scan later, you're going to lose the data you pulled the first time. So um, keep that in mind. If this is a tool that has value to you and that you want to start using, you're going to have to build processes out for how to uh, manage the data that's generated. Um, one of those parts that uh, I feel terrible about, I don't have the dev chops to make the tool sexier than it is. I uh, don't know how to fix the 500 errors I'm running into, or I would. Um, so if you like this project and you feel that you can help make it better, or you've got other things that you're doing in your own shop, and you're like, man, if OWTF just did this, because it's a flagship project, you've got an audience, you've got a community, and you can contribute back to not only your own dev security efforts, but to everybody else who's using the same tool. Um, so my uh, recommendation for you, uh, this was just 45 minutes of some guy up here screaming at you about security testing. Um, give, give it a, a run, give it a shot. Pull down um, OWTF, pull down the OWASP testing guide, uh, throw it against a non-prod version, even if you've just got a local instance of an app running on your laptop. Just give it a shot and see what it feels like. And I, I think if you've got that hands-on usage, as a pen tester, there's a lot of stuff in this tool that I don't use, that I, I won't use. There, it's some of the things are just personally, uh, I've been doing it other ways for so long that I've built other processes that get the job done. Uh, but I think if, if you were to give this a, a run through, try a few plugins, uh, you might be able to save time and gain visibility into actual attacks. And then most importantly, you might be able to validate uh, some of the findings instead of spinning your wheels, fixing something that doesn't need to be fixed. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to share out, um, resources. So let me use uh, Jenkins, right? So if, if you're comfy with Jenkins, there's another project I wanted to tell you about. I'm not talking about it today. But if you wanted to hit my uh, SlideShare account, um, I did a presentation for Columbus OWASP on Gauntlet. Uh, similar concept that you, uh, it's, it's much smaller, much more contained than OWTF, uh, but it automates security testing. Um, so if you're looking for a free, simple solution and you're, you're Jenkins friendly, um, that might be more to your liking. Uh, Samurai WTF, which is, I love the names of some of it's like burp, right? There's just some great names in the, in this industry. Uh, web testing framework, it's a Linux VM that's got a lot of these tools built out. Um, in the pen testing space generally, Kali is built out with more tools than you'll ever use as a pen tester so that you can pick and choose the stuff that you care about. Samurai was built as an open source uh, VM that is the same way uh, what Kali is to system pen testers, uh, Samurai is to web app pen testers. So you might find uh, some value in Samurai um, if you give it a go. Um, there is an OWTF YouTube channel uh, besides Brussels, London. I think it was besides London, uh, 2012. Uh, one of the, I think it's like the project Lee has his uh, intro. Here's here's OWTF for the world. Um, so if you want to get into his whole, uh, he's got this whole philosophy behind the Spartan army, and uh, yeah, it's crazy. Um, but he's uh, he he's got a um, a historical driver for why he built this tool and, and his philosophy and uh, putting it together. Uh, and if you want to just hammer away at a deliberately vulnerable web application before you start testing your own apps, I wanted to make sure everybody was aware of the OWASP Vulnerable Web Applications Project. It's got a lot of uh, different apps that have grown up over the years, like WebGoat and Utiliday. Um, and, and they are uh, apps that were built for training purposes, right? WebGoat teaches you how to hack Java apps, web apps that are written in Java. Um, Utility is all PHP. Uh, so if you wanted to hit an app that you know has vulnerabilities with this tool before you start baking it into your own processes, OWASP has already got that built out for you too. I'm a huge OWASP fanboy. Um, I just, I want to find, like, I feel like I, I'm able to contribute by sharing information and, and getting up here and geeking out about stuff like this. 
and I'm trying to get to a point that I can actually write code so I can contribute to these projects in a more active fashion. That's what I wanted to hit. Do you have any questions, comments, yep. discussion? Yep. Folks, uh, more folks coming in. I really appreciate your time this morning. If you have questions, hit me up. I'll do my best to answer them. Thank you.